All right, welcome everyone to Artist Talk on Art. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We have a program that's part of our legacy series. So before introducing that, uh, we'd like to invite you to next week's program, which is a panel called Mir Miracle Mud. And that will be moderated by artist and curator, Jalen Hanrana, Hanrahan, I think I said that right, who is an active board member here at ATOA. So next Monday, May 23rd will be Miracle Mud and Jerilyn will be introducing us to several awarded ceramic artists living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So for tonight's legacy program, we'll be screening a recording from the Artist Talk on Art archive that originally took place on December 4th, 1998. And this features a trilogue between three well-known artists, Michael Goldberg, his wife, at the time, Lynn Umloff and Linda Banglis. So I'll just give you a brief bio for each of these artists featured in tonight's legacy series. Michael Goldberg was an American abstract expressionist painter and teacher known for his gestural ac action paintings, abstractions, and still life paintings. A veteran of World War II, Goldberg was one of the last few remaining survivors of the New York School he was sometimes referred to as a member of the so-called second generation of abstract expressionists, although he began exhibiting his action paintings in important group shows in galleries in New York City in the early 1950s. Goldberg began taking classes at the Art Students League of New York at age 14. And in the 50s, he studied painting with Hans Hoffman and discussed painting with artists like Willem, Willem de Kooning, Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Mark Rothko and several others of the New York School sometimes um, at the 8th the Street Club, which was a regular meeting place of modern artists working in and around 10th Street in New York. Lynn, sorry, Lynn Umloff was born into a family of artists in Austin, Texas and moved to New York in 1967. Her sister, her twin sister, Madeline, introduced Lynn to the painter Michael Goldberg in 1969, and they married 10 years later. Early in her career, Lynn was exhibiting in Italy and had her first New York show with the Hall Brahm Gallery and her first museum inclusion at the 1975 Whitney Biennial. Her work was increasingly taking the form of large on-site installations. She also prowls the Italian countryside making uh, Im improvisational drawings that are closely connected to sculptures. Um, as Art Space describes, her method consists of using sanded and impregnated paper with pastel, watercolor or acrylic mediums, often glued on free-shaped canvases, which lends a handmade quality close to fresco. The result evokes analogies to shields and masks of primit primitive societies, but Umlov engages her work in a push and pull movement with inside and outside ambiguities and live structures like painting in the air. Linda Benglis is an American sculptor and visual artist known especially for her wax paintings and poured latex sculptures. She maintains residencies in New York City, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Greece, and India. Benglis's work is noted for an unusual blend of organic imagery and confrontation with newer media incorporating influences such as Barnett Newman and Andy Warhol. Her early work used materials such as beeswax before moving on to large polyurethane pieces in the 70s and later to gold leaf, zinc, and aluminum. The validity of much of her work was questioned until the 80s due to its use of sensuality and physicality. So that's everything. We can start the screening now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our very distinguished panel tonight. Uh, I have to tell you, get, make just a few announcements. Our program meeting is going to be, uh, our program committee meeting is going to be Thursday, December 10th, a mile off to cross the street, 579 Broadway, 4A, and everybody should bring six slides. I thought it'd be nice if we looked at one another's work, as well as having a business meeting and a little bit of a party for Christmas. Uh, next week is an important night for the Phoenix Gallery. As you can see by the show, 
You know, they're always our wonderful hosts, and they, they lend us this space absolutely free of charge and put up with us very sweetly. And uh, next week is, is a panel celebrating their 40th anniversary as the oldest co-op. And, it, and other galleries will be represented, and the title of the panel is What Makes, what Makes a Co-op Successful? So hope to see you, and then we break for our holiday. Um, now, without further ado, I'm not going to introduce our panelists, because they're just going to talk about themselves and introduce themselves, <laughs> but I don't know who is going to start. <laughs> Lynn. Okay. You can... Are you showing slides first, or? No. Oh, oh, we just talk. L let me just say that yeah. this is about Mike and Lenny and not me. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, going to introduce Lynn Umlaut, whom I've known for 30 years. And I think Mike Goldberg, I've known for 32. <laughs> so I think they've known each other for 30. And you need no introduction. No, I'm sorry. My name's Linda. <laughs> and and uh, Lynn, Lynn is going to show her slides first, and then Mike Goldberg is going to show his slides. And they each have 11 slides. And I've asked them to show something, some little history that uh, takes place over these uh, 30 years. So, Lenny. But I don't want to show slides uh, yet. I, what I want to do is fill you in on some of my, my own history, um, which Donna said she was going to do, but then I'd have to tell her, and it's easier to tell you. Um, first of all, my father was a sculptor, Charles Umlauf, and my mother was a painter. They met at the Art Institute in Chicago. and. Um, there's one person here who actually knows my father's work and, uh, and my mother. And so I, I need to, to give them all of their due uh, applaud. Um, but anyway, my father was saying to me as I was growing up, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're able to help me in the studio, you know, cut the clay, sand the wood, um, help with the plaster cast and um, wax things afterwards. Well, he had a whole crew of us. There were uh, three older children and three younger children. The eldest three, my older brother, Carl, and my sis twin sister, Madeline, and I are all artists. And um, the youngest three are slowly getting there. <laughs> Arthur's already started, and Lewis, Lewis is actually uh, helping ca take care of my father's estate, and he, so he's, he's a little bit slowed down by all of that work. And Tom is um, building car and motorcycle bodies and designing the dies for um, um, 3M company, but I think he's actually going to become an artist too. Um, he makes great hot rods. He makes great hot rods, as Michael said. Um, the, uh, the other thing that my father, he said, don't be an artist, and so that left me with, well, what? what? I, in a sense, I, I got to college, and I didn't know that there was anything else to be. <laughs> so I started out at the University of Texas and uh, finished my bachelor's degree there. And, um, and also, uh, oh, then I went to New York and lived here for a year and uh, went back, got my master's. No, wait. I see, I, I, I think I, I spent a little bit of time in between because I went to Italy for another year um, on a loan, a student loan, and then went back and got my master's. Sounds sort of wrong. <laughs> 65 was the bachelor's degree, and the master's degree was in 68. So uh, I, I finished the bachelor's after going to New York, and then the master's after going to Italy, which I lived in Florence for a year, 65 to 66, the year before the flood, and actually helped my father put on a show there in Florence um, of his sculpture in this it was the Galleria Santa Croce, right next to the, in the Piazza Santa Croce. And that was a real pleasure, because by that time I was speaking Italian very well, 
better than he ever did. And so I felt I could help him with the, not just the communication, but some of the uh, negotiations that happened with the gallery dealer. For instance, they didn't understand how he could have a, a room full of sculptures of nudes in, in such close vicinity in the, in the same room with uh, sculptures of uh, religious popes and um, <laughs> Jesus Christ That's and okay. Mary. And <laughs> he, it's, it's still a little bit odd, but I've got used to seeing all these sculptures together and I, I helped, you know, make that transition for him when it came to the Italians. <laughs> At least I tried to help. Um, so my father was a sculptor. My mother, with all of the six children, became a she designed the grounds for the, the, all of the sculpture. And when we grew up, she then had more time to go to this Episcopalian church and designed the, uh, the building and the grounds of that church with some help. But she was very involved with not just being our mother and a writer, a poet, but also doing everything that she could um, not competing with my father, but actually being um, um, a, a moral and a physical support. Um, after I finished my master's degree, I, went, I stopped dealing with the figure. And I started <coughs> painting from nature. But the nature I was painting was painting myself in nature. So I was always involved with the, the in a sense, a pre, the, my present interaction with it. Somehow you feel, or I feel when I, when I look at the painting, um, my own, I feel where I am in that landscape. And it's not necessary, as you all know, in an abstract to recognize a figure. You, you simply understand what I'm talking about now when I show you some of the slides. Um, Then the, the, the reason that I'm, I, sh I started with painting and then went into sculpture uh, is to, what I'm looking for is to show how all of the light and form and material, physical materials, paint, color, are put together and how they can be stopped, find a stasis, find a moment when everything coalesces. And then there's that possibility that it can all disperse, that kind of breathing in and out that happens normally with us and with nature. I try to get in my, in my work. Can we have the lights and the first slide? If you want to ask me something about... Well, you're supposed to use that. No, you said I can walk around with this one. No, no, no. No, I'm sorry. This one. Cat? Oh, too bad. The spotlight is only on the standing line, so... Uh. This first slide is of a painting that uh, I finished in 1972. It's eight feet high by six feet wide. And I showed it at the Reese Paley Gallery where the Mercer Hotel is now. It's pastel, on, pastel and gum Arabic combined and, and uh, both uh, drawn and painted because gum Arabic is dissolved in water, um, painted onto the paper. And this particular one isn't backed with uh, canvas. Um, the way that I felt while I was working on it was that each of the panels that I found, each module became like a growing, a moving figural form. But there's also the reference to architecture here in the kind of perspective and the structure and the, um, and the color, that building and space. Um, 
again, I, I get a lot of the feeling for architecture from my mother and the feeling for nature from my mother and the feeling for all of this surface from my father because of this always working with uh, feeling and waxing and, and um, holding form. Next slide. This is March 1977, I had the title of it, 30 inches by 40 inches. So it's about this high. As the, 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 um, the left hand side dips down. And you can see how much color there is underneath the, the uh, skin of color. The drawing that happens inside inside the body of the paper and the way that I've worked with the mm, emulsion of gum Arabic and then it begins to be a, um, almost like a um, watercolor. Uh, and it's glued on top of canvas so that I can actually cut the uh, paper and keep building the segments as I'm working. And I also have one, two, three uh, eyelets and nails in the top and two at the bottom in the corners so that it can be hung the same way uh, when it's finished and that I can take it down and put it down on the floor and work on it also. But I, I always prefer to work up on the wall um, so that I can see the form develop and see the drawing develop and stand far enough away with one thing you can't do on, on uh, the floor. And as I said, the, the, the forms feel both like a torso and like parts of a landscape in the color reference. The next slide. This one, that actually was bought by a, an Italian collector when I started showing in 74 um, in Italy. Um, this one is March 1977. Um, it's a small piece for a large wall size piece. And Linda and Mike and I were all in a show in Patterson, New Jersey um, with her sculpture, my painting, and Michael's painting. Um, I believe there were, was it just three or were there some others? Lucio was in the show. So there were others. Lucio Pozzi was in the show. Um, this is the small model for the large piece that I showed at that time. This one was done in June 11th, 1979. It's 56 inches long by 16 and a half inches high. And it's in uh, Steve Weber's collection in Boston. It, it works in such a, a three-dimensional way for me, I, the way that the space between the forms and colors, and this area is just canvas. And it's nailed here and here, so there's a, a torque in the forms. I think there's uh, simply one nail here, and here, and here, and here. Canvas, as you know, and paper, they respond to heat and cold so that they also breathe while they're hanging. And um, the kind of glue that I'm using helps that. It was, I was using jade and, of course, the gum arabic. It seems to really get very tense in dry weather and very floppy in wet. In wet. And so you get always a change of the light within the piece and the light shadows. Um, I believe that I was working with uh, also some acrylic in this. Next slide. Next one is November 2nd, 1980, titled. And it was actually stolen in some shipment that was going to a show in Philadelphia called Jumping Off the Wall. I don't know if any of you were also in that show, but a whole shipment was stolen. And, um, but I did get a chance to show it in New York at Hal Brahms Gallery before, and that I felt happy with. This, in a sense, takes off where Matisse's dancers leave. It's the, the circle of the dancers going around 
And actually, do you feel like you're going to the backside and to the front and, to, and underneath? It's very three-dimensional, this form, because of the drawing with acrylic on top of the canvas and, and the paper, and the way it, relate, it uh, ties in that way. And the mm, serpentine kind of line and curving that you're getting around it. Next. This next one is called July 20th, 1987. What I found with paper was that I could get the, con the concave form and I could, get the con I could get the flat form and a little bit of convex when it dried. But I always wanted to, then what if I wanted to stop it, that curving, and not have it always breathing in the air off the wall and making shadows? What if I wanted to, to walk around the piece and see the movement as I move and, and actually have the painting uh, not be wet to dry and wet to dry and continually in this, um, flux that was going on, but have the paint where I put it, with the curves where I put them. And I even kind of sewed with wires and fiberglass and uh, acrylic glue. This is not fiberglass and resin, it's acrylic. Um, the color into the, uh, into the wire mesh and um, hung it from a, from a, a um, center of balance in the back of the sculpture. So this is almost like a, a fat tent or a big fat pillow that hangs toward you. And it actually comes from sitting inside a cave and seeing all around me um, the way the light came into the cave, the way that the color then glowed with, uh, from the, the time in the morning to the evening. It's almost like instead of painting Mont saint Victoire, I was sitting inside it because I felt I was the part of nature. And I made about five years of work from this same cave um, um, because it was such an experience. It was both a womb and, and an inspiration. This uh, area right here, if, it, if I'm going to measure the projection, it would be about 36, uh, 40 inches off the wall. So it's uh, 47 inches high by 48 inches wide by 40 inches deep. It's fiberglass, wire, wire mesh, and acrylic. And it, the way I painted the inside is with a kind of a silver silvering blue and gold. Because of that, that top inside, the way that felt um, almost like as haloing. Uh, the cave itself fell in recently. The, the, I don't know whether it was just the, transparent of the transparency of the, of the ground or what, but the, the structure of it was all rooted. So I could see how it was sewn together. And the top of it, um, it was like this very, um, the color of caliche in Texas talk, that's the, a color of a, a yellow clay. Um, and of course you, can, you know that no cave has this much color in it, so it's totally abstracted, both the form and the color. Next. This one is February 6, 1989. It's 78 inches by 25 inches by 50 inches. And I brought it in because I was saying that I stopped working with the figure, but the way that I think of my sculpture is as a core, the vertebra, the, the uh, balance that we have around that core, and the, the way that the joints interact in space, in weight, and this is hanging from the ceiling, um, where the person who bought it is hanging from a skylight. So it really has a wonderful light interaction with the sculpture. Uh, it's fiberglass on top of a very, very fine 
wire mesh. I think it's a triple woven wire mesh in this area here. So you can see through it, even though it doesn't look like it. This then is aluminum sheet aluminum with more, um, if I could walk around it, it's about this size. And then it's with more uh, forming at the top here with uh, uh, fiberglass and wire mesh and paint. But the fun thing about working with the paint, with the sculpture, is that I can keep on both changing the color, building the form, and watching the movement of that in the, in the space and how it works against the reflection and um, how it calls itself up in the color work above and then how the, uh, the lines again keep uh, referring back and forth. Drawing in the air. Next slide. I, I, I name my pieces by the date because that's when I finish them. Sometimes they take a, a month, sometimes three or four months. This one is called March 1st, 1992. It's 30 inches by 24 inches, pastel, ink, and mylar. It's um, actually the ink, you can see the gray. Um, I mixed ink with acrylic there, <laughs> and it's still it still is holding up, <laughs> so is the mylar, because uh, the person who owns it in Houston I've seen since, since 92. And um, then you can see pastel on it, and uh, it's a back and forth uh, uh, use of, of both the pastel, the acrylic, the gel medium, and um, some metallic pigment that I, ground, that I grind up with the acrylic. And this, I wouldn't be able to do my sculptures if I weren't able to make the paintings because I find the space of the sculpture in the, in the transparency and the space of the painting. Next slide. That painting was a, a, a painting around this sculpture, for example. This is called The Cult of Maria. I was asked to put the work in a, in a Little, a small church that was deconsecrated in Italy outside of Venice. And I saw the space in front of the altar as being a, a possible placement, not just for the attention, but they would be out of the way of the frescoes that were on, in the church on the walls. The, the frescoes, the church was built in the first century um, after Christ. And the um, frescoes were done um, tenth century, in the 10th century. It was 10th century. 10th century after. I'm sorry. They, they say one, but it means the 10th century. And the frescoes were done in like 1100 because they were frescoes that were done by, I think there were. Uh, seven frescoes, so there were seven different artists, and they were very naive artists. They were painting Mary and sometimes the child, and that's why I call this the cult of Maria, because the whole church, this small oratorio it's called, was dedicated to Maria. And this, in my understanding, of this abstraction and, and the drawings that I made and the year's work that I put into this sculpture is the death, no, rather the birth of Maria, where the rubber is, re is laying flat on top of the wire mesh cylinder that you can see through. That kind of birth and movement, the spiral, the growth, and then the ascension of Maria hanging from the ceiling. This is actually a photograph taken in my studio. I didn't want to distract with all of the frescoes right now because uh, of the limited time. Um, the, the hanging piece is 100 by 37 by 42 inches. 
and the standing piece is 27 by 36 high by 43 inches wide. It's a very heavy rubber that you, you can cut by hand. What year is that one? The date is 1992. It took a full year. Next. This is called June 10th, 1996. Um, it's acrylic paper stretched on canvas and stretcher, and it's, again, a painting that leads to a sculpture, but uh, they may lead to them, but I consider them, I, I, fin I consider them finished in themselves. They, they satisfy my sense of, of their own space and relationships within themselves. I can find the sculpture better, but that's almost like saying you do one thing to do another. It doesn't mean that one relies on or depends upon the other. This is a, um, a painting that, that you can see that it's stretched on, the, the paper is stretched on canvas because this is the edge here, and this is the canvas here, stretched on top of a stretcher. And, um, I was finding it necessary to expand the space of the painting as I painted flat, and then I'd order the stretcher um, afterwards. Most of the work that I'm doing and showing, in these last ones in the 80s, from 86 on, I've done, started in Italy and carried back to New York and finished there. This, I actually finished in Italy and sold it there in a show. Um, it's in a restaurant now called the, Vi the Golden Calf, Vitello d'Oro. Uh, what were you thinking of when you did that painting? I'm thinking of um, the space of a tree, the leaves uh, hanging over in that yellow that's coming over, and of the, the brown vertical, which is one tree, and then there's another. <coughs> form in front of all of that, which could be either a figure or, or or again another tree. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of nature, thinking of uh, the smoothness of fig trees, the way that their, their limbs are when you feel them, that silver. And then the, the uh, way that the green, yellow is of the, the flowing form of banana leaves and the base in the red, that weighted form is somehow at the cut off segment of, of a tree that I found and brought into the painting so that many parts come into it, although they weren't there in, to begin with. And uh, what I actually was thinking of was the sunlight through the, the color of the green and the green-yellow, and the shadow that makes a color uh, as the light goes through leaves, and the way that the, um, the earth then allows things to grow back up. So it's a very circular kind of action that I'm thinking and, and painting that I think that life is circular. It either hangs in the balance, a, a, a nucleus of molecules, or it stands or flows like a waterfall. I, th I think that I continually make that circular reference in my work. And also, um, I find that this painting goes back from the, paint, the sculpture that you just saw to the one next one. Next slide. The core, the core of the tree that was chopped off, this is taken from that. that this is a plane in this, right here. And you can see down into the heart of the sculpture, which is made of colored fluorescent, um, phosphorescent yellow plexiglass and uh, fluorescent long, um, I should say neon light that I sheathed in blue plexiglass and um, there, there's a kind of plexiglass that they use in Italy that is for greenhouses and um, 
uh, uh, showcase displays that is actually corrugated, so it doesn't let all the light through, but it really transforms the colors around it. That pinkish red is casting onto the light. I see now, the light is, is, is reflecting off the pinkish red and turning both of those lights uh, fuchsia, both of those colors fuchsia. And so as you walk around this sculpture, there's an interaction of the colors. They kind of osmose into each other, keep coming around and around this way. Next slide. This is the last slide. October 10th, 1998. Can, you, can you see this? It's, um, this part is a vinyl globe right here. This is a fluorescent light held by a sheath of stainless steel wire mesh. This is a plane of aluminum um, that holds the, the globe up, um, it holds it at the top, it holds it at the bottom, it goes underneath here, you can see it right there. And then, of course, the light cord. This is a welded aluminum and fiberglass aluminum to, that you can see through the globe because you stand it right here. And it, it feels like Saturn, but it also feels like a nest, it feels like an air bubble. So it's, it has this wonderful sense of its own space and identity. I, what I was doing when I made the, uh, the leg support was to thicken the line so that it really grows into the, the Saturn's ring and supports as well as um, throws it off balance. So it seems to move and it gets you moving around it. You see through it and see around it because there's reflections in the vinyl. How tall is it? It's, um, 34 inches high by 44 inches wide by, no, 44 inches long from the one end of the wire mesh to the other, and then 29 inch um, circumference of the, 29 inch uh, circumference of the globe, the vinyl globe. Where, where is it shown? I, I, I just brought it back from Italy now. Oh, it's in my studio. I photographed it in the studio in Italy. The, the one before that was, um, that was in my studio again in Italy. But I put paper underneath it. But I finished it here in, in New York. They don't seem portable, but I bubble wrap them <laughs> and I put them back together again like a chiropractor. It has to be here. <laughs> Screw it, bolt it, um, uh, cotter pin it, and um, sew it, and and then it's it's surprisingly movable once I get it together. It's like a, like a body. Do you have another question before Michael goes? Well, we can we can talk more about. See that finger. You know, the interesting thing for me about being on this panel, or the idea of the panel, is how do two artists live together for as long as Lindley and I have lived together and maintain our sanity and continue to work? And also what rubs off on what and how, you know? And I think that should be of interest to anybody who's involved with making art. Uh, so we'll get to that. Uh, we both thought that, uh, and we sure didn't have much discussion about what we were going to do, uh, but we, we both thought that uh, in introducing ourselves this way, by showing work that we've done, et cetera, et cetera, you might get a clearer idea uh, of who we are. Now, if I come across as being arrogant, it's because I am arrogant. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been making art for a hell of a long time, and uh, I still find it pretty much the only thing that's of uh, excitement that I still do. 
Uh, I've done other things. I uh, was a soldier. I was a race car driver. I was a pilot, all of which I was pretty good at. And I no longer do those things, but I still make painting. And I'd like to read a little statement. <laughs> I've been circling some elusive image or vision for 54 years, trying to get close to it in many different stylistic ways, and I'm not getting much closer. Uh, my father was a vaudeville hoofer, a dancer, uh, and he was in some of the early musicals in Hollywood. Uh, he was the partner of a very well-known uh, actress of the period named Mae Murray. Uh, he quit uh, the stage uh, when he married my mother. Uh, my mother's father was an autocrat who uh, would not have his daughter married to a hoofer. Uh, but our house was always filled with his uh, theater friends. And uh, it was a rather interesting way to grow up. Now, I don't know why I'm mentioning that, because Lindy said that I should mention it. But it's kind of interesting in this remove, you know. Uh, in terms of my own work, I seem to have gone from complexity to simplicity to complexity, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And, I, I've noticed in, the, in terms of one of the slides, which I'll point out to you that I'm going to show, I was trying to combine both my idea of complexity and simplicity in the same work. Uh, it's not a very good work, but it was an idea that seems to be kind of relevant to what I'm trying to do today. Uh, now, I don't have any of uh, slides of uh, the work of the last two years yet, so I apologize for that. And uh, I'll go very quickly through these slides. I'm not going to, uh, all of the work that I'm going to be showing in slides uh, is quite big. Uh, and that's about all I, and they're mostly oil or, or uh, various mediums on canvas. Uh, if you've got any questions about them, you can ask me afterwards. <laughs> can we do the slides now? Oh, I'll indicate dates, more or less, you know? So that's in 1955. Next. What? Yeah. Next. And that's 56. <coughs> Next. Uh, and you can see this is 62, and you can begin to see what I mean of, of uh, how, in my terms, those first two, and I have paintings from before that, they're really getting fairly complex. And uh, this was an attempt to simplify. Now, obviously, uh, one doesn't usually have slides of, of the, uh, the interim work, the work that leads from one idea to another. Also, I should really say this, that, that uh, I, I find that, that uh, my visual ideas are very limited, and they're very circular in their development, very much like a slinky toy, you know? So you come across the same concepts, the same ideas, the same desires, hopefully at a higher level with more information. It's not guaranteed. Sometimes you slip way back, you know? Uh, next. So then this goes to, uh, I think it was 68. And I, I don't know if you can see it in the slide, but it's composed of about half a dozen different interlocking canvases that I used as sort of a structural device. Uh, and I did a lot of these things. They're uh, still kind of interesting. Next. Michael, yeah. doesn't this have the structure underneath it too? No, this was on a single canvas. Also, there's a funny story about how to do that. You get an idea of the scale, there's a hand here, you know? So it's a big mother. But uh, <laughs> what was interesting about this is, is that I was using bronze powders and uh, a clear alkyd to draw into the bronze powders and also to fix it. Well, what, to do a painting of this kind of scale, you have to, do it, you have to work flat. 
So I, I did a reverse Michelangelo. I, I constructed sort of a low bridge over the painting, and I worked on my knees, you know? But it was really a drag. <laughs> but anyway, next. So this is, uh, I think, 72. And this is the painting I wanted to, I was trying to explain. I mean, it's not a very good painting. It's very reminiscent of Frank Stella, as a matter of fact. Hardly. But, huh? Hardly. Well, but it, it, to me. But uh, <laughs> it, it was using that same kind of attitude of the blue one before, but complicating it within its own context. You were looking at a lot of tantric things then. Exactly. You remember that, yeah. In fact, remember the big one? They want to buy that now. Uh, next, please. Now, this is, uh, I think it was 82. And, you know, now they're, they're becoming. Uh, I, I've been very uh, interested in all kinds of classical architecture. Uh, and uh, with the idea that uh, in uh, classical Italian architecture, the units of measurement had to do with the human body, uh, the arm, the leg. There's always what they call a mesura di ventura, when uh, they use one unit of measurement for the facade, uh, another unit of measurement for the height. And when they didn't meet, they, that's mesura di ventura is a measure of chance. They just filled it in. And that interested me in relation to these paintings I was doing. Next. So again, this is about 84, I guess. Very landscapey in a way. Yeah? And again, a lot more complicated, a lot more hand in it than the other one. Next. Now this is what, uh, 95, I guess. And uh, there's obviously a relationship to writing. Uh, if one longs to communicate, uh, the use of uh, the various forms of uh, writing or alluding to those forms is an interesting kind of uh, shortcut, I think, to communication. And I've been interested in various kinds of scripts, uh, none in particular, but just the variety of them. Next. And this is from uh, 97, and it's the last one I'm going to show you. OK. Now we've seen the uh, wonderful works of both Lynn and Mike, and it's, it's very interesting that uh, they're both such uh, strong and original artists, really original. And looking back over them, I mean, the earlier works, I think they're equally as strong. I mean, it's it's uh, because we have such a contextual reference, and it leads in, it's consistent with what each of you have uh, set out in a way to explore. Now, do you always know what you're exploring? No, no. That, I, that's why it takes me so long to make this, the uh, painting and the sculpture. I keep going back and forth in this, from the flat plane to the round, three-dimensional, to the um, hanging, standing, or flat. Down, it's just no. I have a, a nucleus, an idea. It's like that dream we have. The I know the feel of it, and I know the the sense of it, but I don't know what it looks like. There's there's something I can get some of the joints together that I I have a feeling about, but that doesn't tell me what the work will look like. So it's a total surprise when I find that I've finished and, that, and I recognize something about the piece. But I'm mostly finding out. What's well, interesting to me, Lenny describes her building and her emotive response in uh, structuring. 
Michael, do you feel as though you're as emotive in this way? No, I, I work very differently. And uh, I mean, what I, I, I do tomorrow is predicated on what I'm doing today. Uh, I don't know if it's a logical sequence or a logical development. Uh, I tend to do lots of work on paper, uh, but almost as warming up exercises, not in the sense that it refers to what I'm going to be doing as sketches or something like that. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, very different than Lynn, because Lynn is a night person. I'm a, a morning person. Uh, I get up early, and I'm raring to go. I mean, I have a cup of coffee, and I'm off. We know you drink a lot. How can you do that? Uh, well, I get to bed early. <laughs> I, I do like to drink, uh, uh, and I do like to drink very good wine. And I'm able to indulge my taste in good wine, but unfortunately, I drink too much of it. But I, I'm not a, a very good drunk. Uh, and I uh, go to sleep rather early. I mean, I, I, you, know, <laughs> you sleep well. I sleep very well, and I wake up, and I, I usually don't have a hangover. So <laughs> he he wakes up and starts working at eight. I get up and I start working around eleven. Four is closer to it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going at it. <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, we've achieved an interesting kind of. Uh, schedule, I guess, of household chores and stuff like that. Since I'm up early and I get my day's work usually done by two or something like that, like I'm the one who does most of the shopping, uh, <laughs> which is funny because I'm not a good shopper. Uh, uh, I mean, I really am serious. I mean, I, I, we both like to eat well, and Lynn is a really very good cook, and I'm a, an adequate cook. I can follow a recipe well. But uh, I, I certainly does, don't mock it, and, and uh, with any understanding of what, what to say, a good piece of beef, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what's a good vegetable. But Lynn, on the other hand, can go to markets in small Italian hill towns, and old ladies will come up to her and say, uh, Signora, is that a good melon? That kind of thing. Uh, but I tend to do most of the shopping, you know. Uh, he's, re he's referring to the way that I'm going and holding everything. Yeah. And the uh, the Italians, they think, well, if you if you manipulate the vegetables and the fruit too much, it's not good for the stuff. And that's the only way I know how to buy is by feeling and holding and smelling. And so they end up asking me if it's okay. <laughs> well, that one's better than this one. Also, uh, we spend half a year uh, in Italy. We've got a, a, a farmhouse and uh, in the country. And Lynn is a gardener. And I have made it a, a rule not to know the names of almost, or not to be able to identify any kind of tree or flower or vegetable. I'm just against it. So I'm the one who's the waterer. Uh, <laughs> and I enjoy that. I'm very good with the hose, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, things like that. And it falls naturally to both of us, and we certainly don't object to one uh, not wanting to know anything about gardening. Uh, I mean, you get a little snippet here and there, you know, you lazy bastard, you know, whatever. But uh, I don't take it very seriously. I think that's really one, one of the uh, kind of ways that two artists can live together, that the seriousness is involved with the, with the work. And pretty much anything else is not terribly serious. Or not serious enough to get your blood hot, you know? Uh, Michael, you mentioned architecture. Uh, uh, you mentioned handwriting. Uh, when you've gone back and forth and made these very implacable paintings sometime, and then you go into something that's more almost broken up and more continuous, the handwriting mm -hmm. paintings, uh, do you see that as opposite, or do you see that as the same thing, just the other face of it? The other face of it. You know, because it, in a way, like, uh, I've done it before, you know? So that's what I was trying to say about that slinky toy metaphor, that uh, either you come up against the same concerns with more information. Uh, I should say this, too. I'm really very uh, uh, both uh, knowledgeable and influenced by classical art. 
Uh, and I seem to change what classical artists uh, I keep looking at every year, but the attitudes interest me enormously. Uh, I'm not uh, great for copying uh, classic laws, but you know, you lift a little bit here, lift a little bit there, uh, you make it your own. I should also say that nobody's on any of our backs saying, hey kid, make that work. I mean, nobody gives a shit, you know that. And so I think if you don't have any kind of uh, enduring passion within yourself for that work that you're going to be doing, why do it? And I find that, that uh, commitment uh, very prevalent in the past. I think that the religious conviction is an interesting phenomenon that we no longer share in. But I think you can get an idea of how painting uh, was uh, an extension, I suppose, of that kind of conviction. I don't know how many of you have recently seen uh, the Rothko and the Pollock show. But if you did, I, I should say that I was struck with how impossible it was for me to deny the validity of any of that work, both Rothko and Pollock. I didn't have to like them, but there was a, 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 a I was gonna say quality, but that's a rather difficult word. Uh, but there was something that one couldn't deny you couldn't turn your back on that work. And I found that really very wonderful uh, in, in the sense that so much of, of today's work one can turn one's back on. Uh, would, would you say that uh, these abstract ideas, say, of that particular generation were more simplistic in a way? Maybe, maybe. More direct, certainly. More direct. More direct. Well, no, you know, I happen to know most of those people quite well. And uh, there, there was a deep conviction that what they were doing was vitally important. That the conviction doesn't exist. You have to be crazy to have that conviction today. You know, that art could change the world. Jeez, that you'd kind of whisper, you know. Also, there was a quality, once they uh, really were into a mode, they repeated themselves, or they repeated the ideas, not themselves. Uh -huh. You're talking about Rothko principally, aren't you? Rothko yeah. and, and Pollock in his drip areas. I mean, he died before he could get out of the classical <coughs> drip areas. Yeah, but I was struck in that Pollock show with how those uh, paintings they did just before he did the drips where he was using paint squeezed right out of the tube. Mm -hmm. Certainly anticipated the drip paintings. They're the same kind of paintings, in effect, using a different technique. In fact, you know, it's interesting. The only person who successfully kind of uh, got Pollock's message at that early time was Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, everybody else who really kind of, uh, you know, leaned on Pollock made little Pollocks. And they were lousy. I mean, and that's, I guess, what I mean by the, the uh, oh, I guess the inevitability of uh, Pollock's paintings in, in the sense that uh, I knew people who uh, thought Pollock was the greatest thing since Wings very early on and uh, felt that the process uh, was the important criteria for the quality of the work and proceeded to use that same process and made miniature Pollocks. But one could tell the difference. I'm, I, it's amazing. Uh, using exactly the same method, same paints, everything like that, they made little Pollocks that you could tell were not by Pollock. That's because of the drawing. I don't know what it was because of. It was because of the lack of uh, passion, I suppose. Uh, because they were copying somebody's process, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but isn't that drawn? I don't know, Lenny. I never really f kind of puzzled it out. What, what you know? Lenny, what the, would you the say? Show, excuse me, the, the show that uh, Joan Washburn has up right now of uh, Pollock drawing and painting compared oh, out of the Guernica, out of Picasso's um, Guernica is so beautiful. It's so extraordinary what you see in terms of the drawing that's going on. It follows up what he's saying. You, you, you'll never see that kind of drawing. It, it wasn't simplistic. It's, it looks as fresh now as it did then. I'm speaking of a classical faith, and I'm speaking of if you think of art as a kind of uh, continuum of ideas, 
Uh, is there such a thing as taking from this classical phase of Rothko or Pollock and going on from there? Or, or you know, do we look at Pollocks and we look at the early Pollocks, which may be more meaningful, or do we look at the later Pollocks? that may be more meaningful in the context of what you might be doing or what you might be doing? You know, that's I mean, a tough question to answer. I know yeah. what you mean, but uh, you know... Or what, uh, you know, anyone yeah. in this audience may be thinking. Well, uh, well, I, I mean, yeah. isn't it fairly open? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, art comes out of art, my God. I mean, it's circuit of... Uh, and it always has been. Uh, I was just thinking that... that uh, I mean, I remember at the, uh, say in the early '50s uh, uh, th that uh, uh, one of the reasons so many of the younger painters, like myself, uh, were so divided in in what they were looking at and what they were reacting to in terms of what they were looking at, is that it was much easier to uh, say ap appreciate and, and really get into de Kooning because he was more accessible. I mean, it was a direct kind of extension of, uh, say, European, Western European art, whereas Pollock was doing something uh, that had uh, very few, if any, antecedents. So one could lift from de Kooning very successfully, but you couldn't lift from Pollock. That's what I was trying to say before about these people who made little Pollocks, you see? I, uh. I use Pollock in my thinking about looking at the way he, he mm. digs into the space of a canvas, I feel that that's what I'm doing when I'm making a, a line move in a sculpture. I, I use it in my way of thinking that uh, not, as you know, you can't copy painting and sculpture, but just the kind of aerial projection that he makes in his painting is totally inspiring. Well, Lenny, I think you've talked a lot about uh, the material and your involvement with material and the surfaces and the illusion as well. And Michael, you've talked also about material and your interest in material and paint. What about the idea of metaphor and subject? You've mentioned somewhat some of this, and I think um, you know, is this an issue at any point I, in your yeah, painting? I oh, prefer yeah. to st stay clear of the idea of metaphor mm -hmm. because it's, it's too reminiscent, to me anyway, of uh, narrative. Uh, and I, I would think, I'm still a big reader, uh, and uh, I like reading. I, I uh, use it almost. I can't see how anybody after Titian would even want to use the figure. You have to be crazy, or after Velasquez, you have to be crazy. Lenny, do uh, you ever have arguments about this? I know you argue about food and cooking and <laughs> squeezing the melon sometimes. <laughs> no, not about, I agree with him about the figure. I, I, I don't think it's possible to to you think you're rebelling figure. from your father's involvement with the figure? No, things? I think I'm maybe rebelling against all academic uh, uh, solutions. Okay, Not that's my good. Father. What no, about, I, I love what my about, father's work. Okay, what about metaphor, though, in your work? Let's be specific. Yeah, in my own work, I, I, when I see something that looks like, I try to use that. I try to let it happen. And I also, there's that restraint that I, f I feel it, maybe it's my respect for nature that I learned from my mother, that you, if you copy nature, you really, uh, it's almost like the gods don't like it. You can't do that. It, it doesn't work. You can't try to paint a tree and have it look like a tree. We all know how to do that because we went through school. What I want it to do is to have the spirit and the soul of it, so the metaphor of it. Well, no, my, my feeling about metaphor is that metaphor is something that stands for something else. Uh, isn't that what you mean? Yeah. Symbolic. A and uh, I would like, uh, at least the paintings that I do, to just stand for themselves. What about names? I mean, you do name some paintings Sometimes. and you don't name other paintings. Is it because you think that these paintings are metaphorical or more or less metaphorical? 
No, no. The, the reason I name it something. Our sculptures. It, it, the name sticks to the painting or the sculpture. Well, what does that mean in terms of your? Is that a suggestion to the viewer? Is that a hint? No, not at all. No. What is it? No, I think everybody has their own take from the mm -hmm. from the work, and it it can. The name that I give it, it's just something that it grew into. It isn't supposed to help you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the only help is, is, uh, is the way that we were saying, that you find out what the work is with time, with looking. So the names aren't hands? No, with, uh, I, I have at least uh, the most fun with names because I, I'm very arbitrary with the names. Uh, if I do the paintings in Italy, I give them Italian names that I lift from the titles of classical paintings. Uh, if I do it in the United States, our building was once called the Boys Institute. So I've done a lot of paintings called the Boys Institute One, the Boys Institute Two, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Uh, but that's kind of boring. I had a book called Bowery Days, and then I had another book called, uh, it was about San Francisco, uh, Barbary Coast. And they had great names in the index. So I used the index for a number of years. That red painting from 62 was called Dear Woe. Now who the hell was Dear Woe? But it was in the index. It was a, another one was uh, Club Woman's Vigilante Committee. Now that's a great name. And I used it. Uh, Lenny, I want to come back to you and the names. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, don't you, uh, I mean, I think Michael may be less, um, well, I can't say less involved because the names are really, Funny. I mean, you really search for them. Yeah. And I know you really search for your names as well, but there's, uh, in the context of, say, Italy and the fact that you are, or have made works within the, a church, for instance, and you might name these pieces, having exhibited them in the same area. Uh, did you feel called upon for any reason to have that? I mean, was it a kind of religious experience in a sense? I mean, this is a very naive question. I mean, you didn't name it, just the date. I... So I just, I mean, I, you know, I want to look, know a little bit more well, about that. In that specific, I, I named it the cult of the, of Maria, the, the cult of Maria, what? because I felt that that's what the whole area, the whole experience was for me and everybody that walked into that little building. It was just amazing, it, and you could say that that has something to do with the religious experience, but I'm not a churchgoer, so I wouldn't fix it right there. Well, let, let me go on. Uh, and you mentioned something about configuration and the skeletal aspect uh, of your work. Are you uh, involved with the organic, uh, almost proprioceptive feeling of your own bodily feeling? or? Would you describe it as a, a feminist feeling in any way? I mean, mm -hmm. would you describe, uh, you mentioned the womb and your earlier cave work, and you also, uh, you know, are involved with, to some extent, uh, you know. Well, what you're asking is something that I answered before, is that when I see something, I let it grow, I help it. It's, it's really not something that I feel is control, it's simply um, like giving birth to something. You have to let it happen to, and support it and make it. But would, you but would you deny the experience of this experience, this uh, of your own body? Not at all. Okay. No, I think it's, I'm, I would never deny being a woman. I think the, it helps the work. The, 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 the female, this sense that I'm giving is, uh, it helps the work become a, an entity. Okay, Michael, what, to what extent do you think your work implies that you're male? You know, I, I, I don't think about that. Uh, <laughs> I, I just, ne it never entered my mind. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I, 
<laughs> I still don't think about it. <laughs> I, I wanted to, to amplify something that Lynn did not say. This church was in a, a small kind of bustling city outside, in the Veneto, outside of Venice. It's, it's really very small. It's about as big as this room. Uh, it's a perfect example of what they call Romano, Romanesque art, in a miniature scale. And it, it uh, has a little kind of parkland around it. But it's been restored, obviously, and it's breathtakingly beautiful. And these frescoes that she mentioned, there's seven in all. Uh, it's really an early example of artistic criticism because a lot of them overlap others, not entirely, but in part. So one is sort of painted on one part of another, you know? And they're all about the same size. They're approximately, say, four feet high by about three and a half feet wide. And most of them, sorry, were uh, Maria and the child. And they are very crude. And the, the interior at the very end is this uh, niche that had this bare marble altar that must have been, again, about four feet high, about four feet long, and about two feet wide. But it had no covering on it because the place was deconsecrated. And it was a forbidding piece of stone at the end, you know? And How nice that you were able to make yeah, something yeah. And, uh, yeah. What town is it? Spinea. The town is called Spinea. Mm -hmm. you know, it's about 15 kilometers outside of Venice. Yeah. Uh, Linnea, it occurs to me in saying these things, one thing that, uh, th that I've understood about uh, women, <laughs> I get back to this, and sort of maybe even maybe associating your work with nuances that women are able to concentrate on many different things at once and get information all at the same time from many sources. When I look at your work, sometimes I think it's coming from all directions. Mm -hmm. You know, it has a sort of feeling of light or smell or... Mm -hmm. So I, I have the experience when I look at your work that you're thinking as a woman may think. Mm -hmm. Because I think men think more directly and more concentratedly mm -hmm. on things. Yeah. So, so yeah. I just want to bring this up, that this is mm -hmm. maybe a possibility the of I, the difference. Yeah, I don't know if, if that's the difference between men and women, and I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but in terms of the difference between Lynn and myself, she is much more circular in her thinking and I'm, or at least I try to be more direct. Uh, I, I would say that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I'm I mean, experiencing I, 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 in the yeah. work. I'm not talking yeah. about anybody else but you too. I've uh, tried to explain uh, to students, because we both teach at the School of Visual Arts, that uh, Lynn is, is much more uh, interesting in a funny way than I am if one has the patience to follow her well, why do you argue so much? Oh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, but what do you argue most about? I always know when you're cooking, you always argue. Is that yeah. because you do the shopping? And no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a circular against the direct. I, I, <laughs> you see? <laughs> it's really quite true. <laughs> yes, it is. I think. I it never is. thought about it this way, but I, I'm sure that's what it is. Uh -huh. uh, and so we do. Uh, I, I, I was a first sergeant during the Second World War, probably the youngest first sergeant they had in our army. And uh, I got accustomed to uh, browbeat people. <laughs> and I, I still think <laughs> that I've got that <laughs> attitude. Uh. Um, no, his, his <laughs> point when we're, when we're doing something together is that why don't I tell him how to do something? And I, I, I can't delegate authority. I simply have to do it. And so he said, why didn't you tell me that that needs to be done that way? So I, it, that is a little bit difficult to say how it should be done and what it's going to come out being. You see, it's against my nature to say that. Well, well, so that's well, what we It gets me angry discussion. just hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> where, where do you think art's going, Michael? 
<laughs> what a question. <laughs> I don't think I'm prepared to answer that. Yeah. I think you'd need a, you know, a crystal ball to kind of figure that one out. Uh, Lenny, do you have any feelings about, if not where art's going, what do you want to continue to do? You know, art today seems to be so market-driven that, you know, the art at least that you hear about, that uh, it makes it rather difficult to kind of answer a question like that since I'm not uh, terribly interested in that. Uh, realistically, uh, I'm not ignorant of it. It's just uh, not something that I'm, I'm quite interested in. Uh, I, I, I find that there's lots of art around if one takes the opportunity to look. Uh, and there seems to, you know, people were hollering about the death of abstraction. Shit, I mean, it, it's so ridiculous. Uh, there's been good abstraction, bad abstraction. I remember uh, in, well this is really a case in point, in the uh, 50s there was uh, a, a great deal of process driven abstract painting being done. And there was more rotten art being done than you could possibly imagine. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Well, you know, uh, and that was a time when uh, there were very few venues for showing one's work. I mean, today, what are there, about six, seven hundred galleries in New York alone, huh? Uh, I'm talking about a time when there were only four or five galleries in New York that showed contemporary American work, you know? Uh, what a difference, huh? And uh, so you can spend days going around to lots of galleries, you know? I mean, looking at... Uh, Indifferent work, interesting work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think as long as people are trying to make art for whatever their reasons, there's going to be a, a, continu a continuity, and there'll be things to look at, things to respond to. What I was thinking is that the the more uh, galleries that I go to, the more I feel that there's not much going on in the galleries, and that I I see in studios a, a real drive for making personal <coughs> art and sometimes I see see it in the group shows in New York mm. and in Italy and and I think it's it's very healthy the situation but not in the market do you, do you find there's more art going on in Europe that you're interested in? Not particularly. Yeah. What, what I, I think that, that's really very true is that there's no orthodoxy in today's art world, and I find that really wonderful. Uh, there's no one way which uh, seems to be the dominant artistic mode today, and so I think one is free to commit suicide in any way you want to. Huh? <laughs> Lenny, you've shown uh, quite a bit in Italy. I think you must have uh, influenced quite a number of younger artists. Do you see this happening? I mean, can you actually, you know? Yeah. And how does it make you feel? I'm proud. Good. And do they come to you? They must know you for a long time. You've been showing since the 70s. You were saying 73? Yeah, 74, I 74, uh-huh. Um, 72 it was. Uh-huh, 72. Um, I, th I think but that's part of the battle. It's the same thing here in New York, is to always keep your work available. It's, it's difficult. That, yes, I'm glad that people know what I'm doing, but even I find in teaching, in Italy and in here in New York, the the people who I expect would know my work or Michael's work or your work, they don't. They they a lot of younger artists and students are not aware of what they what they're taking from. They simply think that they came from them, and so I I, I find that very disturbing. They should know who. Uh, help them. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I did want to ask, and what role does teaching itself directly play 
I mean, how do you feel about teaching? And I know that you Well, as I said, the, the young artists, to me, have a lot to offer. And I'm glad to share it. I, I have just the reverse idea. Uh, I'm not, uh, I've never gotten anything from a student, ever. Uh, and I'm not interested in getting anything from students. Uh, I am interested in, for, I should say this, I would pay, I, we teach at the School of Visual Arts, I would pay them for the opportunity to teach. Because it gives me the opportunity to do a job from A to Z and to do it well. Which painting does not, you know, give one. It's, it, painting is endless frustration. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's serious. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like teaching, you know, I get there, I'm up for it, I do the job as best I can, and I leave there whistling. I mean, the kid should be exhausted, but I leave there whistling. I feel, oh, done a good job today, kid. And uh, every so often, uh, I only teach in the spring semester, and every so often I haven't done a good job, and I'm aware of it. So our boss, as Jack Witten knows, is a friend of mine, it's Gene Siegel, and I say, Gene, I want to quit. So, oh, no, you can't quit. We need you. That's all I have to hear. They need me. I'm theirs, you know. So, Can, One thing we didn't speak of, uh, <laughs> I think we've covered all the topics that I've just sort of written down, but one thing, I haven't, uh, or you haven't mentioned influences, direct influences. Well, one to the other, you mean? Uh, one to the other, how you bounce back and forth, or outside influences. Mm -hmm. I mean, can, can you remember, or do you think you just sort of take it in? No, I'm, in, I'm influenced by lots of things. I'm certainly influenced by Lynn, because uh, I see her work all the time, you know. Uh, I don't think it's a direct influence, it's an oblique uh, influence. You know, it all kind of filters in. Uh, I mean, I, I don't look at her work and say, oh, Jesus, that's great, i got to lift that, you know. I don't, I don't think that way. But, but, uh, but Michael makes uh, some colors that he makes, I find very inspiring for the kind of atmosphere that I'm trying to create in my own work. So yes, the color. Yeah. And even the kind of um, inter-knitting uh, inter of lines, I find. Yeah, interesting. Your locking paintings, I thought, mm -hmm. sort of uh, the awkward way that they locked, but I mean, it was very geometric. Uh -huh. I'm always so, moving like this when yeah. I work, so yeah. to see that happen is, is it's interesting for me. Mm. I'm not sure it influences me, but I appreciate it. Okay. I mean, if we use if you if you appreciate something, you yeah. sometimes use right. it. I am. I'm right. sure I use okay. it sometimes. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's the last thing. What do you want to continue to do? It's obvious, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here we are, open to the audience. Questions? Well, I'll start. Uh, I was going to ask Michael, uh, when you came from Chicago... I never came from Chicago. I was born in New York. Oh, you were born in New York. Okay. Came you came from Chicago, right. At the time that... Uh, you were born in New York. I didn't yeah. know that. Okay. Um, there were a whole bunch of artists, though, that arrived at around the time that you were starting. Uh, were you a Hoffman student? Yeah. And there were a bunch of people that did come from the Midwest and sort of became Hoffman students right around that same time. Can you talk about who some of your contemporaries were? Well, I think I that might be yeah. interesting to hear. I started uh, studying with Hoffman in 19... What's that? 41. Huh? And uh, then I went into the service in 42. Uh, when I got out, I went down to Venezuela. I got out in 46, so I went down to Venezuela for about nine months. Came back, and I was partially paralyzed. And uh, I started again with Hoffman, and I guess it was 47, end of 47. Now, I had been wounded three times, so I was getting a big disability pension. and. Uh, <laughs> I had made a lot of money in Venezuela. I was working in the oil fields there. And uh, also I had a wife. But I went back to Hoffman. And, uh, but I had a studio on 9th Street. And his studio was on 9th Street too. So I never went to the school. Uh, he'd come off and uh, visit uh, once a month or something like that. But uh, I don't know who the hell was there from Chicago. I, let's see. Uh, 
Angelo Apollito was at the school. Uh, God, my memory's going. Uh, Miles Forst was at the school. Uh, Wolf Kahn would drop in from time to time. I don't know anybody from Chicago, though, who was there. Uh, probably were, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember them. Uh, Ah, you got me. Uh, what was interesting about the school is that uh, most of the uh, men there uh, were veterans. And the general feeling was that you're trying to make up for lost time. I mean, I was in the service for four years, I was, and I was a young kid, you know. Uh, <coughs> so, and also, like, everybody used to drop in. <coughs> so uh, there, there was a community going on at the school. Uh, that that uh, Felix Bacillus was there. I don't know if you all knew his work. I thought he was a wonderful painter uh, who seems to have disappeared. Uh, it's uh, abstract. No, he was figurative. Gandhi Brody was around. Uh, anyway, I'm so, I can't be more specific. You also spent time in Provincetown? No. 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 Okay. I never went to the school there. Uh, <laughs> I spent uh, one summer in Provincetown, but not at the school. Anybody have any other questions? It's an, I should say this. <laughs> you know, Hoffman was really the world's worst teacher. <laughs> uh, you couldn't understand what the hell he was saying. He had a thick German accent, and he had all the shorthand that he'd say. He'd say, Nicker, Nicker, which he meant Nick Va, you know, Nicker. Uh, it's like Puerto Rican saying, Mira, Mira. Uh, um, but he was inspirational in the sense of this deep love and passion for art. And that rubbed off. What about that whole push and pull thing? Oh, who listened? You didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> I'm really serious. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an exciting place to be. <laughs> Other questions or comments? <laughs> yeah. All right, Dai. Hi, Michael, this is for you. Uh, I heard your comment about drawing a tree since Titian is a waste. I, I want to know how you feel about the trees of Van Gogh and Cezanne. No, no, you, you got, did. I didn't say anything about a tree. You said that drawing the figure was a waste. Figuratively. Figuratively? I, no, I said figuration, I think. Figuration, okay. What do you think of the uh, figuration of, um, say, Van Gogh or Cezanne? <coughs> What do I think? I like Van Gogh's painting a lot. Uh, I, I don't look at it for the sensible subject matter, though. You know, uh, Dr. Gachet of the wheat fields, all that crap. I look at the way in which it's, uh, you know, I look at the intensity, I suppose, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is that an answer? Excuse me. No, I, I just would like to know how you feel about the painters Van Gogh and Cezanne. Just your impression, like your feeling. I like them much. Okay. I think Michael uh, relates more to Van Gogh and Lenny to Cezanne, myself. No, I'm... Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you know, I, I should have been perhaps more specific. I think that in, in the light of so much extraordinary uh, classical figuration, uh, why one uses the figure for a uh, narrative kind of uh, material, it, it, as I find very uninteresting, that's so. all. Uh, but I'm talking about really right now. I'm not talking about 100 years ago, you know? I think that Cezanne could get away with it, and I think that even Bonard did good. Did you see the Bonard show? Yes. There was, you know, I saw it this summer. I came back from Italy for three days for something. and. Uh, I saw that Bonaccio, and I felt I was in a Viennese pastry shop eating too goddamn much. I mean, it just made me filled up. Unfortunately, because I thought there were some extraordinary paintings there, you know? Uh, but it wasn't the figuration that got to me. It was all of that rich paint, you know, that great color they get, all that stuff, you know? So I may look at paintings differently than you. I probably do. So, Mike, what qualities uh, would you say 
uh, constitute a good painting? I wouldn't get into that. I don't, I don't know. That's a variable, Bill. Oh, come on, Michael. It's Try. a variable. I, you no, know, I really mean that. No, no, no. It's a variable. That changes. For yourself and your paintings, but what qualities, when you're painting over the course of days or months, or if a painting goes into the next year, what quality or qualities are you trying to bring forth to that so that you know that it has been resolved? Well, I think that's just a gut feeling, Bill. Uh, I can say this, that I had two paintings. Uh, I work on stretch, and I got movable painting walls. I got a big studio. And I had two paintings that I did uh, last spring that were up on these walls. Well, we got home end of October, and I kept looking at these things. One, I finally ripped off the wall. Not ripped, I took it off the wall and cut it up. I got another one that that's going to happen to too. Now I believed in those things when I left them. You see, you see what I mean? I mean, I really I thought, hey, those were terrific paintings, and uh, I can't pin down why I changed my mind about them, you know. But I certainly did change my mind about them. These are big paintings. I invested a lot of time in them. Yeah? I concluded that they were lousy. What time sequence was that? Well, I did them what over a three, four month period last spring. And then you're just now looking at them? Well, they were, yeah, up, we, yeah I, looked at them, I couldn't nice avoid thing. looking at them. They were up on and, the walls. And you so actually I, cut them up? I cut one already, yeah, in four parts. I showed you, it's in the, <coughs> uh, that <coughs> box there. That you didn't want to paint over it? I couldn't, no, it's rather thickly done. Uh, Michael, there's a question for you. In uh, view of the fact that you are a teacher, uh, what criteria do you give to your students? How do you coach them? And Lynn, too, if you wish to answer from your point of view. I try my damnedest to get these kids to leave school. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really uh, am, uh, uh, I see my job primarily is convincing these kids that art making is ridiculous, it doesn't lead to a happy life, and get the fuck out of school quickly. So I'm fairly subversive, you know? But it is the truth. <laughs> uh, my, my answer to that question is, is that in, um, uh, the subject I teach is fourth year to the students right before they graduate. And so it's sort of, um, it's such a tense moment mm. for them that I feel like if I put a pin there, they're going to fall apart. But it is the moment when, you need, when, you, when they need to have uh, that kind of pressure to actually make <laughs> to make work that they are not going to have to uh, try and sell in the gallery or try and put on the wall of their parents' home or their own walls. They actually still, they're just beginning to be doing something that if they're serious, they'd better start doing it more than not less. And I'm afraid that I agree with Michael that it's, it is subversive to ask them to start taking undone the thing that they think that they've done, that they have developed a style that there is their own. <laughs> I, that's not anything about being an artist. That has, they have, at that moment, to learn how to f find out what it is, why they're doing anything in the first place. <coughs> it's, uh, so it's, it's hard to be a teacher. You have to and excuse me, too. it isn't very okay. uh, confirming. I was perhaps a little too glib in you answering your question, obviously. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the teaching bears an awesome responsibility. You're dealing with people's lives, and I'm very aware of that. And I, I find that I, I like the idea of uh, a one-in-one -one teaching student relationship. Uh, in the sense that, that, you know, for instance, very often I have nothing to say. And I've learned that I don't say anything then, you know? Uh, I sometimes have something to say and uh, say 50-50 chance that it's uh, okay, that it's honest, you know? Uh, I can be dead wrong, too, you know? Uh, and that's the risks that one takes. 
Uh, I can sometimes be illuminating, I can be helpful. Uh, I try to be helpful. Uh, you know, I do all those good things that a teacher is supposed to do, but uh, I see myself doing them. I'm not a spontaneous teacher. Uh, I don't have any program, and I don't have any message. And if I did have the message, I certainly wouldn't tell anybody, you know? So, I mean, that's about the only way I can answer it. I'm conscientious. I do look for uh, things that uh, I can help be helpful about or helpful with, you know? Uh, I have a message yeah. that no long, it doesn't really matter how long uh, and how well you think you've got the, um, the image, the form, the thing out into the subject, it's never enough. Okay, I think that's a good point of ending. Are there any other questions? Yeah, one more question. One more question. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank Lynn and Mike. Both the slides were wonderful. The narrative with it was just really fascinating. I, I want to know so much more. Uh, Mike, this is a question for you. When you, uh, in the 40s and 50s, did you also know Leo Manso and, um, and that group there? I bought a piece from Leo's wife who had, uh, you know, used to sell art, yeah. uh, which I still have, to, both of them, I bought two pieces. She had a summer auction up in Provincetown in their backyard. So I didn't know Leo terribly well. I forget her name, uh, something mad. So blah, blah, blah. Anyway, but I still have uh, this Indian miniature yeah. and that uh, Mesopotamian uh, Fertility Act. Uh -huh. said, you know. What did you think of his work? I'm sorry? Were you familiar with his work, and what did you think yeah, of it? I know his work. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I didn't like it. Uh, how about uh, Robert Motherwell? Yeah, I knew him. And? <laughs> uh, he hated me. <laughs> uh, and I didn't much like him. And uh, my reason is really hilarious. I was introduced to him by Bradley Walker Tomlin in the gallery on 57th Street. And he on, had on the most beautiful, beautiful tweed coat I'd ever seen. And the sleeves were frayed. I think he's son of a bitch trying to be an artist, you know? Because he had lots of money, always. So he could have afforded to have it either meant to get a new coat, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny reason. I hated him because of it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank our trio, Linda Benglis, our questioner, and Lynn Umloff and Michael Goldberg. Thank you all. And thank you all for coming.